taken from the top. First of all, but started. Hello, my name is Tommy Davis. I'm the collaborator in chief at TVC Labs here in Yapa, Lagos. I'm also the chief investment officer at Green Tech Capital Partners of Frankfurt, Germany. I'm president of the Africa Business Angels Network and a co-founder of the Lagos Angel Network. As a Lagosian from the Ogumade family in Lagos, I'm also a member of the Lagos State Science Research and Innovation Council. Oh, and as you might have suspected, I'm an angel investor too with a growing portfolio of Nigerian-based tech startups that are using innovative solutions to address our significant challenges. Well, so enough about me. The organizers have asked me to share my thoughts with you on building a smart city infrastructure, a venture capital approach. Well, that's a very, very big topic. So I thought I'd start by setting context to the challenge we face in my consideration of this topic so that you understand why it's a significantly important one that needs to be addressed. Well, let's first of all start with Africa, the African context as we see it in 2020. It's worth considering that 17% of the world's population, or to be more specific, 1.3 billion people living on 32 million square kilometers from over 3,000 scribes, speaking nearly 2,000 languages in 54 countries, eight regional economic communities, but fortunately now, one continental free trade area make up what we call Africa today. So when we talk about Africa that way, we need to consider that African markets actually operate in our cities. Per capita consumption in African cities is 79% higher than country averages and highly concentrated with just 75 cities in Africa accounting for nearly half the continent's consumption. And of the 200 million Africans considered middle class, well, 50% actually live in the top 18 cities. Well, that paints a very, very interesting picture, you might say, but Africa does have its own challenges. We're urbanizing faster than any region, with cities gaining 24 million people per year, making for an additional 187 million Africans living in cities within the decade. This urbanization explosion of both population and land cover poses threats to the integrity of the continent's ecosystem and biodiversity, especially with the dearth of available infrastructure to support it. According to UIS data, of about 258 million children out of school for the 2018 school year, more than half, 57% to be exact, were children from Sub-Saharan Africa. They were only followed by South Asia, which was just at 19%. Lack of proper education and limited access to knowledge remain the factors at the core of the African challenge with education. Conflicts remain Africa's biggest security threat to the point that the African Union had to create a silencing the guns initiative aimed at ending all wars, civil conflicts, gender-based violence, violent conflicts and preventing genocide on the continent at that time by the end of this 2020 year. Laudable as that may sound, I think we can all agree that the goal is unrealistic, especially with the continuing insurgency in the Maghreb, Iraq, Somalia, and even here in Nigeria with Boko Haram highlighting the security challenges. Limited access to electric power and endemic electricity shortages are hindering the socioeconomic development of African countries, most of which are dependent on expensive fossil fuels with Nigeria being no exception. In fact, <laughs> the running joke when I was growing up about the former Nigerian Electric Power Authority, PLC, which was NEPA PLC, was actually, it stood for, never expect power at all. So please light the candle, PLC. Now, when you look at all of these challenges, um, 
you now can see, well, for why, where we take a position that smart cities are actually the solution. Because at the core of these challenges is the development of smart cities that can take advantage of the opportunities to provide a sustainable solution for the continent's growth. Well, ladies and gentlemen, disruptive technologies have revolutionized many of the services we use, transforming the way we work, communicate, shop, and travel. These technologies have allowed providers to reimagine the way that people interact with their services, making them more accessible and more responsible, responsive to real-time demand. In the same way, smart cities reimagine the way that citizens interact with the urban landscape, using cutting-edge technologies to create more efficient urban systems and better informed citizens. A smart city uses intelligent technology infrastructure to enhance quality of life in urban environments. For instance, by minimizing waste, optimizing energy usage, or reducing congestion. This is made possible by the Internet of Things, that network connection between everyday objects, which means that nearly all elements of the urban landscape, including transit networks, energy grids, lighting systems, and parking monitors, can wirelessly, wirelessly broadcast their state and activity in real time. So you may ask, what then is smart city infrastructure? Well, smart city initiatives worldwide have various frameworks, dimensions, and pillars that are used to describe these interrelated elements that make up the smart city dynamics. As you can see from this framework, which has a smart citizen at its center, the components for a smart city include smart buildings and housing, smart energy and environment, smart governance, smart health, smart mobility, and of course, smart infrastructure, which is what we're talking about today. Now, although new hard infrastructure is sometimes required for smart cities, these systems can often be superimposed on existing infrastructure through the installation of cheap and discrete sensors. The resulting smart city infrastructure is dynamic and reflexive, monitoring its own operations, predicting faults before they occur, and optimizing the delivery of resources or services to match demand. In addition to sanitation and drainage, public safety and emergency management, smart city infrastructure uses ICTs, including the internet, of course, telephony, the IoT I mentioned earlier, and video surveillance. This dependency on ICT for smart cities with the smart system at the center leads me to the importance of ICTs that make up the smart city infrastructure. Let me explain. Well, ICTs are recognized by the African Union in its draft digital transformation strategy for Africa 2020 to 2030, which I share the, the framework of here, is a strategy to guide a common coordinated response to reap the benefits of the fourth industrial revolution. Let me put it in context, if I may. The ITU estimates that there were 76.7 .7 mobile phone subscriptions per 100 inhabitants in its Africa region, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, in 2018. That's up from 44.3 in 2010, and a mere 12.4 in 2005. Now, active mobile broadband subscriptions during the period we're talking about stood at 30.7% in 2018. It was at 1.7 in 2010. The table on the right shows the proportion of connections or networks per 100 of the population in Africa for the years 2015 and 2018, respectively. The ITU found that in 2018, 26.3% of Africans were internet users. This was almost a threefold increase over the 2010 9.9% and a tenfold increase over 2005. This is also, there's also considerable diversity among African societies in terms of internet usage, as you can see from the table on the left. Well, I may be giving a very rosy picture of progress, but truth be told, by every single measure, Africa lags behind world averages and other regions. Global internet users, for example, account for 51.4% of the population nearly double the 26.3 here in Africa. 
In the Arab states, the equivalent numbers are 49.5%, at 46.2% in Asia, and the Pacific at 699 in the former Soviet Union, 80% in Europe, and 75% in the Americas. In investment terms, funnily enough, ICTs are a relatively small proportion of Africa's total infrastructure needs. With the Africa Development Bank estimating annual outlays of only $4 billion to maybe $7 billion being needed for dealing with the continent's infrastructural backlog. Even the World Bank estimates this cost of closing the digital divide on the continent over the next decade is less than $10 billion a year. The good news is that Africa's ICT infrastructure has grown over the past two decades in a prime case of infrastructural rollout leapfrogging, data technologies in favor of new ones. Limited co coverage by copper-based telephone systems made it practical and attractive to shift straight to fiber optic systems. For me personally, the most notable feature of ICT financing on the continent is private sector investment. And I would say so as I'm in the private sector. Of the $7.1 billion committed to ICT investments in 2018, well, over half of that, $4.8 billion to be precise, originated from the private sector. Private sector interest in ICT reflects its profitability, which has in turn created opportunities for cooperation between firms within the continent and abroad and with the public sector, of course. It's worth noting that no matter how successful infrastructure is rolled out across the continent, it will count for not if a corresponding expansion of the skills base required for installation, maintenance, and innovation is not developed simultaneously to support and replenish them as the new smart city systems infrastructure components they are. Although the full impact of the pandemic of the COVID pandemic will take years to play out, ICTs for Africa are highlighted the need to get it right if we are going to make the African continental free trade area work for us all. In the near term, there's a common belief that it will affect government's ability to finance large-scale projects. Considering that most African countries faced a gap between infrastructure needs and financial resources before the pandemic hit, with ITs, ICTs being no exception, the gap is now large as a result of it. Delivery of a successful smart city infrastructure demands close alignment and collaboration among a wide range of participants, local, national, and international, each with its own agenda and interests as new developments span the entire industry. China, for example, has a Silk Road across Africa using data center infrastructure to unpin ongoing smart city initiatives across the continent. Given time constraints, let me pick one segment that is close to our hearts here in Lagos and across Nigeria to illustrate the scope of the changes underway. Oh Lord. Pause, pause. Given the time constraints, let me pick one segment that is close to our hearts here in Lagos and across Nigeria to illustrate the scope of the changes underway. There is a high frequency of power outages, low level of public trust in technology, and a large informal economy. In fact, 65% of GDP and 80% of the workforce. There's a high, stop, oh, I've lost my cursor concerns, rising power prices, and regulatory pressures to fuel the adoption of emerging technologies such as renewable power, distributed generation, smart grids, and battery storage. Almost three quarters of new electricity generation capacity built in 2019 use renewable energy sources such as solar and wind, an all-time record. Power companies are using other technologies to improve resilience in a more decentralized market reduce the frequency of outages and connect to consumers. For instance, battery storage is being used to smooth variation in power, overcoming the intermittent, intermittent na nature of the national grids. Global data estimates that the worldwide battery storage market will more than double between 2018 and 2023, growing from 6 billion US to 1 point to 13 billion at the distribution level, sensors and associated data analytics systems are now making it possible to predict failures and carry out remote maintenance and also improve oversight of grid conditions. 
allowing the physical capacity of the network to be increased. Among customers, industrial power users are applying the Internet of Things to increase their operational efficiency and better manage the performance of their equipment. Residential consumers are now using smart meters to reduce consumption. Collectively, this technological transformation is challenging the business models of utility companies to compete effectively in a more decentralized and disaggregated marketplace. These firms are now having to invest in new types of services such as grid management and other energy services. Even as developed economies capture the benefits of infrastructure technology like that of power that I just described, African countries have struggled to realize these same advantages largely due to weak digital foundations and poor adoption rates, as I shared earlier. This is a missed opportunity, especially because the potential savings generated through technology could determine whether a project goes forward or not. While working in some African countries with less advanced technology infrastructure can add complexity to smart city projects, most African countries have a legacy infrastructure and those have little legacy infrastructure and those with leaner, less bureaucratic governments are better positioned than even some development countries in taking advantage of technology innovation to accelerate the digitization journey. In that way, they can leapfrog even more advanced countries in the quest to build smart cities and their enabling infrastructure. To do so though, procurement processes must be transparent and create the right incentives for the application of new technologies. Our governments must also develop supportive regulations to manage use and critically can seek incremental benefits rather than having to completely disrupt established processes. For countries like ours working to build core power, transport, water, and urban infrastructure, the reality is that the traditional models of infrastructure financing, largely cap large capital investments repaid over long periods of time are still attractive. Finally, Governments should stay abreast of what emerging market pioneers are doing. For example, India and some countries in the Middle East are already gaining a foothold in 5G-based smart cities. These leaders will play an important role in setting the pace and direction for other emerging economies like ours here in Lagos that are seeking to capitalize on such technologies in the future. There's no doubt in my mind that new and emerging technologies will be a huge part of the solution to today's infrastructure challenges, improving transparency and efficiency, facilitating the transition to low carbon climate resilient assets and unlocking more sustainable business models. But as in every industry, technology is a disruptive force, displacing traditional ways of planning, financing, delivering and maintaining infrastructure. Incorporating smart infrastructure as with all other elements of smart cities, will require a step change in policy focus. New financing solutions at both the consumer and portfolio levels are more research and development to push faster technology and innovation. Fortunately, these needs are now on the agenda of many stakeholders, including ours here at Lagos State. And over the next few years, we'll see the increased focus on development and smart infrastructure bear fruit, hopefully with our population across the continent experiencing the next benefits. Next, I want to touch on facilitating an enabling environment for the growth of tech development in Africa, because according to Harvard Business Review, Nigeria has a powerful entrepreneurial climate with innovative ventures that demonstrate the veracity and the viability of the environment. These ventures cut across education, FinTech, agriculture, healthcare, logistics, and travel. Nigeria was Africa's leading startup investment destination in 2018, recording nearly $95 million in deals. Here in Lagos, my Yaba neighborhood has earned the nickname Yabakon Valley. The relative affordability of Nigeria's internet is key as the economics ranks it first in affordability in the region. The government's National Identity Management Commission is also set for a massive registration for the country's mandatory national identity number. A unique identity system is essential in developing countries where the vast majority have other ways to prove who they are and thereby get access to public services or financial systems, usually through a mobile phone. I agree with the HBR re report recommendations and wanted to share them here that, first of all, with 87% of Nigeria's economy transacted in cash, with most Nigerians never having heard of mobile money, Nigeria needs to improve its use of digital payments. In 2018, the central bank allowed tele 
telecoms and supermarkets to be payment service banks and take deposits and make payments by digital means. But the practice is yet to become mainstream. So policies to stimulate greater mobile money use are important. These policies to facilitate digitization must adapt to many challenges which themselves must be addressed over time. And finally, a super sizable community of Nigerians that are dedicated to supporting startups and the early stage should be encouraged to participate as angel investors in digital startups, which is something we are arduously working on through the Lagos Angel Network, Rising Tide Africa, South Southeast Angel Network, Abuja Angels, and most recently, that's for Angel Network in Nigeria. All in partnership with the Africa Business Angel Network to build a culture of angel investing across Africa. Now that's my two minute plug. I had to put it in. So if there was ever a time to push progress in Africa, it would be now. As I mentioned earlier, the continent has the ability to leapfrog technological trends with the rapid scaling of digital technologies. I believe there are huge opportunities awaiting to be exploited. The explosion of digitalization continues to gain momentum and digital data design and the emergence of the FinTech sector are all fast becoming the driving force behind this. All organizations across segments and sectors are reevaluating their strategies in response to these trends with new business models emerging as a result. Partnerships forming, innovation scaling, and the time is now to harness these trends to create more opportunities. We in Africa are in a unique position to take advantage of the digital trends that are emerging at present. As a continent, we remain the leader in mobile money with over $22 billion moved annually, with that trend likely to continue given the still remaining significant number of unbanked people across the continent. With the underlying improvements in technological capabilities, connectivity, and the proliferation of mobile devices, we can anticipate exciting times ahead for the digital transformation of the continent. The growing use of big data, mobile cloud computing, and artificial intelligence gives organizations the ability to reimagine client experiences, deliver products and services instantly to a large number of clients and at a lower cost. The other big trends that cannot be ignored are blockchain technology, as well as the much talked about cryptocurrencies. These shifts the way we think about the international payments, trade finance, identity, as well as the future of money itself. Over time, blockchain will bring transparency, cost reduction, efficiencies that the organizations haven't been able to offer before. Well, there is actually a thriving fintech ecosystem. It's not just emerging technologies that are changing the way Africa does business. The significantly lower barriers to entry of technology has seen a thriving fintech e ecosystem emerge. Last year, for example, financial inclusion secured, yet again, the top spot in early stage investments with 54.5% of total investments of 1.1 billion and investments into FinTech startups seeing an $836 million flow into the sector with a concentration around South Africa, Kenya, and Nigeria with the trend actually continuing across the continent. FinTech companies on the continent are looking to go after Africa's problem and opportunities. And many of these companies look into payments, remittances, identity, financial inclusion, and leveraging data to improve credit scoring and access to basic financial products. These companies not only offer job creation, new revenue opportunities, and cheaper methods of delivery, but also improve financial inclusion. How's that for impact? The World Economic Forum believes that partnerships with FinTech is one of the biggest business trends to watch this year, particularly in the technology space. It was initially feared that fintechs would disrupt the big players in the various fields. However, these previous enemies are, becoming to, are coming together uh, to use one another's strengths for mutual benefit, as was demonstrated by Stripe's acquisition of Shola and Ezra's Paystack earlier in the year. Through these partnerships and startup, partnerships and startup business models are starting to evolve and move into new and sometimes unexpected places. For this new digital perspective, the payments landscape is changing. 
and becoming more competitive as young companies look to reduce the cost of transacting, as well as bringing speed and agility to companies operating in the African corridor. Financial institutions continue to increase their fintech partnerships, albeit with quite a, a bit of internal resistance, as bigger organizations grapple with the new ways of working required to partner effectively with the more agile and quick acting startups. With financial inclusion high on the smart city list of priorities, we can get excited about ac accelerating digital growth in Africa. Finally, in closing, I want to say the smart city infrastructure deployment in Africa will only be made possible through innovation, specifically innovation in three related areas. First, innovation in technologies. Second, innovation in financing. And third, innovation in government policies. Please let me explain. The first area of innovation is technological innovation. The world has seen a surge in new technologies that has transformed many industries in the last decade. Industries ranging from telecommunications to music industries have been transformed completely. Smart infrastructure depends on these technological advancements. The first group of technologies consists of those that impact smart infrastructure development at the design and planning stage, such as modeling software, which allows for better visualization, better planning, and better forecast. Over time, better software and modeling has been and will continue to be developed to make better forecasts of costs and time required for smart infrastructure development. All these would lead to better designs and hopefully faster approvals. The second group of technologies relate to the actual development of the smart infrastructure assets. This may come about because of use of the internet, telephony, the internet of things, video surveillance, and even emergency management, public safety, and others. There may also be more unconventional types of innovations, such as virtual and augmented reality. The third group of technologies relate to data analytics, which will make operation and maintenance of smart infrastructure more efficient. Through a network of RFID, drones, and other sensory equipment, a lot more data can be collected today. This would allow for better monitoring, better forecast of demand and supply, and therefore better solutions to match supply and demand. This data would also allow for early detection of defects to prevent wastage and downtime so that the operation of these infrastructures can be more efficient. The second area of innovation is financial innovation. Today, African smart infrastructure is grossly underfunded, and this will not become easier in today's climate of austerity. The government should explore enormous opportunities offered by innovation financing as viable approaches of funding infrastructure. Some viable options include public-private partnerships, such as build, operate, transfer, build, lease, transfer, design, build, operate, transfer, build, own, on, build, own, operate, build, own, operate, transfer, lease, develop, operate, is a big area of innovation that can all unlock private sector funding. PPP brings with it the market discipline of the private sector and helps us to make take into account the full cycle cost of any smart infrastructure project. Given that many African countries have started on PPP, it's useful to look at some standardization of PPP laws or regulations across countries under the AFCFTA banner. Borrowing from pension funds, such as that of the federal government of Nigeria's plan of borrowing from the pension fund announced in January 2020, we can learn lessons on alternative approaches to financial innovation. It is important to promote more infrastructure debt financing, especially by attracting long-term patient capital. My expectation is that the World Bank Global Infrastructure Facility, or GIF, for example, can help prepare smart infrastructure plans for cities so that it can become bankable. The third and final area I want to talk about innovation, of course, is policy innovation. Today, government policies are not always conducive enough for smart infrastructure development. They tend to be too focused on the short term, not well coordinated, and constrained by too much rigidity. I believe there are at least two immediate areas that can be worked on. Firstly, smart infrastructure policies should be formulated with sufficient flexibility to cater for future needs and inevitable technological advancements. Smart infrastructure products have long life cycles with demand changing over time. Technology is constantly evolving and will change as well the circumstances under which it is deployed. Without flexibility, we will not be able to cope with the increased demand or unforeseen constraints. A second area 
is for government policies to be better coordinated across various sectors to exploit synergy and make infrastructure much more efficient than it is today. The need for road systems, water carry systems, and sewer systems to be coordinated at the design, construction, and maintenance stage is well known. The need for coordinated coordination of housing development, road construction, and other amenities is also well understood. In the future, hopefully, we can exploit technology synergies for smart infrastructure deployments. For example, is it possible for the private sector financial inclusion platforms to be used for some public sector impact purposes? Today in Africa with accelerating urbanization, there's increasing demand for basic infrastructure and there's a huge potential for smart infrastructure development. If governments are able to have a coordinated approach and build flexibility into their projects, if the financial sector continues to explore new innovations to channel long-term capital to the digital infrastructure sector, and if companies can put more effort into R&D, research and development-led innovations, I personally believe the big gap for smart city infrastructure development can be addressed and all of us will benefit from it. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for listening. My name is Tommy Davis. Please get in touch. Yeah, you, as I'm showing up here, happy to share. Like I said, thanks.